Um, is it recording? Yeah. Hi, everyone. So today we're joined by Dr. Scott Simmons. He's an associate professor at the Department of Anthropology at University of North Carolina, Wilmington. He's the PI for the Lamini Archaeological Project, um, which I think Dr. Tracy Mayfield has also worked at. And today he's going to tell us a little bit about his work on San Pedro, right? Is that correct? That, that's right. Awesome. So whenever you're ready, Dr. Simmons, please take it away. Hey, thank you, um, Lewis, for inviting me. Thank you, Stark folks. Um, there'll be a quiz on what the acronym Stark stands for at the end of this presentation, and I'll probably fail it, but you guys should all pass. <laughs> Anyway, thanks for coming. Uh, I just really am thrilled to tell you a little bit about um, the research that we've been doing out on Ambergris Key. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, I'm happy if you have questions. I, I think you can either interrupt or there's a hand raising feature in um, Zoom that you can use. Um, but we'll see, certainly have some questions afterwards, and I'll I'll do my best to to answer those questions. Um, but yeah, it's just a you know for for anybody, Dr. Mayfield could tell you the same thing. For any any archaeologist working on a a Caribbean island, you know, life could be a lot harder, a lot worse. <laughs> it's a not 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 a bad environment to work in. Um, and th this picture here that kind of lead into the presentation picture is of the, the back or the leeward side of, uh, or the west side of Ambergris Key. Um, it's a true island. Uh, it's the biggest barrier island among several hundred islands, I think, that dot the coastline of Belize. Um, it's the northernmost and the largest and the only That's one that has any kind of substantial town. Sorry, go ahead. Do you have a question? Okay. Um, anyhow, um, that's that's uh, where where Dr. Mayfield and I worked back in 2017. It seems so long ago now, in the town of San Pedro. But what I'm going to tell you about is is work that's been taking place um, historically uh, back in the 80s and 90s on the island, and then we'll move up to modern times to some of the research that Dr. Mayfield and I have been doing. So. Um, yeah, feel free to ask questions or raise your hands, but we'll get going. Um, this, uh, it, it's a shame when you have to apologize for your slides, but this map is slightly outdated. Um, it needs to be updated, but it gives you a sense that there are about a, two dozen um, archeological sites. These are ancient Maya sites that have been recorded so far on Ambergris Key. Um, and you can see, if you follow my cursor, there it is just off the northeast coast of the mainland of Belize. Um, and um, there are certainly more that are there. Uh, one of the things that the, one of the kind of irons I have in the fire is to um, get some LIDAR work done. In fact, do a LIDAR survey of the entire 24 mile length of Ambergris Key, um, because surely there are more sites that have not been recorded by archeologists yet. In fact, I, I'll show you some pictures of a small one that I was taken to that is about right in here, but has not made it onto the map yet. But anyway, you get a sense that it's a long kind of skinny island, um, trends basically kind of northeast to southwest. Um, there are a series of ancient settlements, both on the windward side and, and on the leeward side. And this is the sort of interior part of the island that we're really curious about for that LIDAR work, because we know that there, there must have been more settlements in, in this part. The, the island is maybe about a mile wide at, at its greatest extent here. And there had to have been not just settlements, but probably I think what the Maya called sock bays or raised causeways elevated roadways um, to connect these interior settlements one to another. Um, but so far our work has been in um, San Pedro town, which is here. Um, and uh, I've worked on Mar at the site of Marco Gonzalez, which is at the Southern tip of the island. 
Um, and Marco had quite a relationship, it looks like, with the site of Lamanai during pre-Columbian times, uh, where Dr. Mayfield and I have both worked in the past, and so we could talk about that too. Um, but the first work was done in the 1980s by an archaeologist who's at UT Tyler. Uh, his name's Tom Guderjohn, and I'm actually working with him on this LIDAR project. Uh, and Tom and his team identified most of the sites that have been recorded so far on the island, including San Juan, which is out on this little peninsula here. This is actually one of Tom's photos. Um, Chakbalam is a larger site. None of these sites are particularly big, um, you know, in terms of aerial extent or their footprint. And they certainly don't have any of the big towering temple pyramids, palaces, ball courts, the kinds of things that classic period Maya settlements on the mainland had. Um, but their big focus was trade and exchange. And so the sites didn't need to be terribly imposing or you know, visually impressive, um, but they, uh, the Maya on this island were funneling probably millions of items every year um, around the coast and into the mainland by way of these inland river systems. Um, so they made their mark on the Maya world in different ways. Uh, one of the things that Guter John recorded was the Bacalar Chico Canal. It, it had already been recorded. This is what sort of divides the northern tip of Ambergris Key from the Mexican mainland. And here I've labeled Mexico on this side of the little waterway and Belize on this side. It's all mangrove. Um, but he, he recorded these canal complexes, um, a couple of them, including Bacalar Chico which he thinks was, may have been artificially dug out by the Maya um, to facilitate canoe travel around the northern part, the northern tip of the island. So that canoes that were coming south along the Yucatan Peninsula um, could sort of cut in and cut out about 24 miles of extra travel by traversing through the canal which would lead them into those inland river systems like the New River or the Rio Hondo um, in northern Belize. So just some shots of Guterjohn's sites. Um, at about the same time in the mid 90s, David Pendergast and his wife, Liz Graham, um, who uh, Dr. Mayfield and I both had the pleasure of working with at, at Lom and I, particularly Dr. Graham, they were doing work in San Pedro town, which is really truly urban archaeology. Um, this is the biggest settlement on the island. There are upwards of maybe 18 to 20,000 people that live in, in the town. Um, and Dr. Pendergast was invited to dig on the grounds of a, a hotel. Um, and sure enough, there was an ancient Maya settlement underneath. Um, that's one of the later settlements. And um, this is where Dr. Mayfield and I returned to uh, in 2017, so quite a while later. Um, but it's the only contact period site that we found or has been recorded so far on the island. So it's an important site and it has Maya components from pre-Columbian times. It has a, a Spanish colonial component. Um, we found some Spanish colonial artifacts, not a lot. And then of course, lots of um, material culture from the historic period from the mid 1800s um, when caste war refugees were coming down from Northern Yucatan and settling the island for the first time all the way up to, well, we found some pretty modern remains, paint cans, <laughs> Coke bottles, <laughs> all kinds of things. So that it's got the, maybe one of the longest settlement histories on the island aside from uh, Marco Gonzalez. And we just call this the San Pedro site because it's in San Pedro town. Um, so there's some differences. Uh, this is probably the most text heavy slide. I apologize for that. But just to outline some of the differences between the settlements on the windward side, the eastern side of the island that Guter John found um, compared to some of the characteristics of sites on the leeward or west side of the island. Um, the windward sites to summarize are smaller, not much in the way of formal architecture not much in the way of um, evidence of long distance or even regional trade, few exotic materials. These were fishing 
settlements. You know, they were humble fisher folks uh, who were probably delighted to be living off the rich marine resources that are available to them and on a tropical Caribbean island, not bad. The leeward sites, on the other hand, on the west side of the island were much larger in size um, they had plazuela groups, in other words, uh, structures around in sort of open plaza area, um, formal architecture, although not colossal, not in the way of um, these lovely looking cashews, which are grown and harvested in Belize by hand and are absolutely delicious. But you get a sense of how, you know, big these cashews are by, you know, the picture here. Chichen Itza. Anyway, nothing along that, <laughs> the, that size of structures, but lots of exotic materials, heavy emphasis on, on trade and exchange. Um, and it looks like some people were better off in terms of, you know, there's, there's social status than other folks. Um, this is one of Gunder John's drawings. Um, you know, again, if you look at say, and again, not they're, they're both fruits, but they're apples and oranges, right? You can't compare something like this with Tikal or Palenque or Copan, um, but substructural platforms upon which probably pole and thatch structures uh, were erected. And these were mostly residential, um, but we have to assume that some probably had uh, warehouse facilities to facilitate the trade and exchange that was going on. Um, and I'll show you some of these exotics as we go along. A lot of the structures were built out of what we call reef stone, which can be harvested um, or mined, I guess. And although underwater, I don't think of mining as something that happens underwater. This has to be dug out. Probably the Maya used um, long poles with, uh, you know, chert um, bifaces that tipped the poles to cut this out um, in the shallow lagoon side uh, of the island. So they actually had to go underwater to harvest or mine this stone, um, but it was used in all kinds of construction throughout the island. Um, some of the reef stone is shown here on this, this corner of a structure at Chakbalam, um, because there's not a lot of limestone outcrops on the island. Um, especially in the southern part of the island, where um, they would have had, we see much more use of reef stone than in the northern part of the island, where there are some limestone rot or outcrops. So here at Chakbalam, which you could consider kind of in the nor northern half of the island, it's kind of a combination. Um, so it looks like the formal architecture that you see on the mainland, but it's a little bit different. Uh, yeah, so this is the lagoon side of the island um, where they would acquire the reef stone by really diving down or I don't, no one knows really how they did it, but in terms of diving, don't think that this water is terribly deep. It's about eight to 12 feet deep. Um, so uh, it could have been, um, you know, acquired from this side of the island. We think it probably was. Um, there's Marco Gonzalez. What's happened now is that the uh, mangroves over the last, oh, about a 10 or 12 centuries have encroached on the island. This was its own separate island that could be approached by canoes from pretty much any direction from the north to the left, to the south and the east and the west. But now it's completely enclosed or encompassed within this, um, you know, black and, and red mangrove forest. There's a, a long wooden path that goes from dry land about here. It's about a quarter mile long that snakes through the uh, mangrove forest um, to get to this other elevated place. But you can see how different this looks. You don't have to be a trained archeologist or even have a college degree. Forget about your college degrees. You guys can spot the differences here. You don't need that USC degree. Just kidding, you def definitely need it. And your parents will be highly disappointed if you don't graduate. Anyway, um, <laughs> you're all gonna graduate uh, and hopefully you'll make it to Belize, but there's Marco, um, the site plan. It's the biggest site on the island in terms of its footprint. It's about uh, 185 meters across 
and about 355 meters from uh, north to south. And it's got uh, several dozen structures that have been mapped and recorded primarily at the same time that Tom Guderjohn was doing the first um, Ambergris Key archeological project in the 80s and 90s. This is when Pendergast and Graham were not only working in San Pedro in town, but they were also working at the southern end of the island at Marco Gonzalez. Um, we've actually excavated some of these larger structures, 12 and 14, and found some really cool stuff, burials, all kinds of exotic materials from all over Mesoamerica, beautiful polychromes that I'll show you. But there is, you know, this is one of those leeward side um, uh, sites. So there is a big sort of plaza here. There are smaller little plaza whalers here in some of these groups that you can see. These are probably household groups, right? And the people in those households probably were, for the most part, pretty heavily engaged in not just, you know, fishing or a fancy way of saying that by anthropologists would be marine resource exploitation. Um, but they were also, they were also traders and merchants. Um, so um, we'll take a look at some of this. This is our field school. Um, this is back in 2010 and there's Liz Graham hurriedly walking away. She does a lot of hurried walking when she's in a field. <laughs> um, some of the things that Dr. Mayfield will be familiar with, the ubiquitous sherd trays, um, you know, we're excavating and exposing architecture here. This happens to be structure 14, but boy, what fun to, to be a student and to learn field and basic lab methods by working on an island like this. I was always envious of these, my students, because um, I never got to take a field school. So I'm kind of making up for it by teaching a lot of field schools, or at least trying to. Some of the stair risers, again, some of these structures probably were the, the domiciles of fairly high, middle to high class or high ranking individuals in society. Um, even these small structures that appear pretty modest would have taken a fair amount of effort. Again, if, if you think that the reef stone has to be a, acquired from um, the lagoon side of the island, um, then it's moving the building material, then it's erecting it, then it's erecting the superstructure on top, which again, we think are pole and thatch structures, um, a fair amount of labor for you know, fisher folks and, and merchants. Uh, but this is what the architecture on, on an island looks like, at least in, in Belize. Um, the polychromes are absolutely fabulous. And, We've seen some trends in, in terms of the, the material assemblages of, of uh, artifacts in that um, it appears in early classic times, the focus was pretty heavy on trade. Uh, we've got the polychromes that are coming from the central Paten um, in Guatemala, um, like these beautiful Zakol ones, which are very common throughout uh, the, uh, the lowland area the Maya Lowlands. Um, you could, so this one has some mend holes in it here, which are pretty cool. Um, and then, uh, so, you know, different levels of trade. There's long distance trade that's indicated by obsidian or volcanic glass that we find at, at the, the, uh, these sites, including Marco Gonzalez. Um, so that's long distance trade. And then there's local or sort of regional trade that's indicated by the presence of this really distinctive kind of chert um, that uh, lithic researchers have given a name. It's from the Northern Belize chert bearing zone. Uh, so it's uh, on the mainland, um, not terribly distant from Marco Gonzalez or the Ambergris Key sites, uh, but it indicates that th there are trade relationships that are already formed and solidified and very well established and then maintained through classic times on different levels, again, local and regional and, and long distance. Um, these are some of the really common biface types that we find on the island. And I think these were probably um, used for spear fishing out on the reef. Um, as far as the fauna that are on the island, yeah, in the northern part, there are 
deer, I've heard. Um, in pre-Columbian times, probably, you know, uh, a larger deer population, but there's not a lot of, uh, a lot of wild game on this island. It, it is an island after all, but um, in terms of the funnel assemblage, a lot of the material um, is, is um, coming from the water, either the sh shallow lagoon side or um, on the reef, on the windward side, or, you know, I think we've got some pelagic species too, some deep water fish. Uh, uh, so that was the heavy emphasis, not on deer and uh, peccary and other mammals. Um, so, you know, I love these, these ethno-historic drawings because it, it's, it's almost like the artisan, in this case, the Maya artist is, is, is really trying to encapsulate every single element or every single aspect of life, both on, on you know, the, the mainland here and out in the water. So you can see Maya canoeists and um, passengers and some of the critters in the deep blue sea. Uh, obviously a crab, I guess this is a stingray, um, but lots of different kinds of animals. There's a turtle, um, but it just goes to show that, you know, the, the Maya were, were keenly aware how, how interconnected their world really was, that um, the sea was really an integral part of everything that, uh, uh, every aspect of their lifestyle. Um, yeah, so the lagoon side, um, west of Ambergris Key, very shallow. I think this is where those trade canoes uh, would have uh, been moving along the coastline because on the windward side of the island, you, the water is fairly calm, you know, fairly placid inside the barrier reef. Um, but when you get outside the reef, then the waves are very big. Um, the currents are very strong. Um, the chances of capsizing again with a heavy, you know, canoe laden with cargo from all over, very, you know, probably expensive stuff that the Maya didn't want to lose. You know, the chances of capsizing there are much greater. So I, I think that the, the the trade routes paralleled the west side of the island, and and really the trade took place here. Um, in the shallow waters of the, what they call the lagoon. Um, so what we kind of know from the, the rise of an evolution of Maya society uh, um, during classic times is that uh, there's increasing complexity as, as you go, you know, move from 200, 300 to 500, 700 AD. Um, this, the cities get bigger, populations increase, um, the pace of construction at places like, like Tikal, those places I mentioned, um, the Shinantanish, uh, Karakol, those are some of the bigger sites in, on the mainland in Belize. The pace of growth keeps, keeps ramping up. And um, the folks on these island, in these island communities realized that uh, one of the ways that they could uh, um, really um, be fully integrated into Maya society was to provide a service, not just trading items that you know were flowing around Mesoamerica, uh, but by making salt. Um, and this was the um, sol, uh, well, it's a solar evaporation process uh, in Northern Yucatan, where there are big salt pans in shallow water. But along the coast of Belize, it's the Sol Cosita method. So they were actually taking seawater into um, and putting it in the, these small ceramic containers that Liz Graham has called um, the type name is is um, uh, is uh, coconut walk. <laughs> I had to move the screen so I could remember. Um, the coconut walk unslipped is the type name for the, a small vessel. Probably if you cupped both hands and held them together, that's probably about how big these pots were. Um, and you simply put these pots with seawater in them over the fire and the heat from the fire drives off all the moisture, it evaporates and what you're left with is 
crystal salt. And so we find uh, lots of, uh, I mean, tens of thousands of fragments of coconut walk um, at a variety of sites on the island, both big sites like Marco Gonzalez and really small sites as well. Um, so these alternating bands that you see in the stratigraphic profile are, um, especially the light bands, are millions of pieces of coconut walk on slip sherds that have just been crumbled because once the um, once the vapor, water vapors have been driven off, then um, it, at least Liz Graham thinks that the bottoms of these pots were smashed out to retrieve the salt cake inside. And so the, the pots were made for a one-time use only. Um, they weren't reused or recycled or, um, you know, didn't function for anything else but to boil off seawater. Uh, and so, right, all of these inland communities if you think of the tens of thousands of people at places like Caracol um, in the Cayo district of Belize or Tikal further inland in, in Paten, um, they all needed salt, right? Salt's a biological necessity. So the people on the island were filling that, that need um, by creating thousands and thousands of salt cakes. Um, even at small sites like this one, this is one that, uh, Mito Paz took me to several years ago. Um, I called it the Tab Ha site, which just means salt water. Um, but you could tell that looters had been here because uh, all these, these pot rims um, are here. This is a big back dirt pipe pile that this gentleman's standing on. And of course they were, the people on the island were consuming, oh, it's probably dozens and dozens of conks every, every month. Um, and so we find the shells in, in, in the thousands at these sites on the island. Um, so, right, these are just some of the sites um, on the island uh, where we found evidence of salt production really at a, at a pretty high level. Um, but on the mainland, on the coast, the east coast, um, lots of salt production was going on there too. So it wasn't just the island communities that were provisioning the inland communities. Uh, it was a little combination of um, island and coastal sites. And that's what it looks like in stratigraphic profile. I mean, that's a lot of coconut un unslipped, uh, coconut walk unslipped sherds there. Um, you know, this, these were the, the, the throwaway items of the day. Uh, they got the job done and then were discarded. They're very thin, um, so that makes sense, right? The thicker the pot, the, the, the more delay in heat transfer, right? You want the heat transferred very quickly to the contents inside, which is salt water, um, so that uh, it speeds up the evaporation process. Um, yeah, but the, you know, a lot of the materials were a little fancier, uh, let's say, than um, the coconut walked unslipped. Um, and by the time that, um, especially in terminal classic and post-classic times, because um, of the Maya collapse, the famous collapse, right, or the transformation, as, as some people say, um, or the reorientation of Maya society, we're trying to get away from this word collapse. Um, um, so um, once the inland sites and the demand for salt kind of declines, um, then uh, the emphasis switches back. Um, the, you know, the focus is on trade again. And so you see, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Sorry about that. So you see these trade items like um, the plumbates, which come from the Pacific coast of Guatemala those start showing up on these island sites. And lo and behold, they start showing up in northern Yucatan and in other places like northern Belize as well. Um, here's some more uh, evidence of connections between um, these different communities. Um, in the north, uh, these silo fine orange pedestal base vases are really lovely, really well made. Um, they're found in abundance of places in northern Yucatan, including Chichen Itza. Uh, but um, these uh, 
kind of lightly slipped uh, tripod vessels like this Tebow red pedestal vessel, um, those are more indicative of, of connections with the Paten. Um, and there's evidence that we might have connections with the Gulf Coast as well. Um, certainly, you know, we, in terms of material culture, it's really clear to see that there are strong connections between different communities on the island itself that shouldn't be very surprising, even though it's a comparatively long island, um, comparatively big island. Um, we know that the people there were interacting with one another. Um, you know, if you look at these two vessels, they are almost identical, but they're found um, in two communities, Marco um, at the southern tip, and then San Juan up toward the north. Those communities are, are probably about 17 or 18 miles apart from one another. It's not a great distance, um, but um, I think they could have been, even been made by the same, the same part, potter or the same artisan. It's possible anyway. And then the long distance connections, the strongest indicator of that is the obsidian. Um, the gray black obsidian here um, um, comes from a variety of sources. Um, in fact, one of the other things that we're doing is we've got a pretty active uh, kind of XRF analysis program, if you will, of obsidian um, from the island. Uh, we've already um, analyzed 200 pieces and we've got, um, or sorry, the first analysis was of 110 pieces. The second batch is of 200 pieces. Um, and so the gray, black, and sometimes banded obsidian is coming from the, you know, the, the usual suspects, as they say, El Chayal and Ixtepeque um, and San Martin Hilotepeque, or sometimes called Rio Pichcaya. Um, those are in Highland Guatemala, whereas the green obsidian like this is coming from uh, central Mexico, uh, the Pachuca source specifically. Um, but also there are several other, there, there, I think we have seven or eight different individual sources for obsidian, um, minority of which are from Highland Guatemala. Most of them are from central Mexico. So not just Pachuca, but um, Zacualtipan and Ucareo and um, Paredon. The Paredon source, I just looked this up. Paredon source is over 2,400 kilometers away from Ambergris Key or over 1,500 miles away. Um, Zacualtipan, likewise, um, pretty, pretty distant from the key. Um, it's over 1,000 miles away, 1,030 miles. So when we mean, when we say long distance, we really mean you know, pretty sizable distances. And all of this is being facilitated by a, a sort of circumpeninsular canoe trade um, so this material is moving along the water, um, you know, we're not talking about the ever given cargo containers, but pretty sizable canoes. Um, at the time that uh, I think it was Columbus's last voyage, his fourth voyage to the New World, they encountered a big trade canoe. This is a very famous passage, um, pretty in ethno-historic literature. But they describe the trade canoe as being, um, you know, about uh, 25 feet long. It had a cabin amidships. Um, several dozen people were on this canoe. So this is a canoe that, you know, you, you know, pair up with somebody and th that kind of canoe. It was full of objects uh, that uh, came from all parts of Mesoamerica. So we've got good ethno-historic evidence as well as archeological evidence for long distance trade. Um, yeah, I forgot about the La Esperanza source. Oh, it was 111 samples. Sorry, this is the XRF plot, which just shows the um, relative percentages of rubidium and strontium. Those are two of the trace elements that we look for to try and characterize these source, try and identify the sources of the obsidian. Um, so I'm working with Jeff Ferguson at uh, Murr in um, Missouri. Um, he's helping me out with this interesting computer program to identify these sources. Um, 
San Pedro town, just to uh, kind of keep going here. Um, uh, yeah, so construction was happening at the hotel that the uh, Graham and Pendergast had worked at in the mid 90s. I actually worked at this site for two weeks in the mid 90s. Um, but we were doing work at Marco Gonzalez and it was the end of the field season and I was riding my bike through town and, you know, being, being the curious or nosy archaeologist that, that, uh, that I am, I take, took a look through the gate and saw, wow, there's lots of construction going on. And so I let myself in as if I were a guest at the hotel, right, it's a public place, and I took this picture, which shows that, uh, yeah, the workmen had dug a big hole in the archaeological site uh, to throw in their trash. <laughs> um, so I, to, you know, looked in the back dirt pile, as any good archaeologist would, and found, guess what, Maya artifacts, including this little part of a, a, a slab foot, uh, uh, yeah, uh, sag bottom, uh, vessel, uh, ceramic vessel, uh, probably early post-classic. And I took this and a couple of other objects I'd found. I think I found an obsidian blade and maybe a piece of chert. And I went and showed the woman, Maria Parham, whose family owns the property and she manages the hotel. And I said, hey, Maria, I'm Scott Simmons. Nice to meet you. And I said, do you know you guys are disturbing an archeological site? And she said, oh no, I, I had heard that they'd done work here a long time ago, and, but we weren't really sure where the site was. And I said, well, it's right here. It's under your hotel. And so we you know, formed a nice relationship, got to know each other and, and uh, actually was able to sort of weasel our way in to do a field school here uh, because they were gonna do more construction at the hotel, um, all kinds of permaculture where they were planting trees and digging up uh, parts of the site for irrigation purposes. Uh, you know, they were even talking about a swimming pool um, at one point, which would have had you know, big impacts on the archeological site. So that's how we got there. Um, <laughs> this is a picture, uh, a great picture that somebody took of me literally pulling my hair out <laughs> um, back in 1993. Um, uh, and yeah, it's a very rich site because it has all three of Belize's major time periods encapsulated in one site, the pre-Columbian, Spanish colonial, and then later um, historical Belizean uh, period. So yeah, I don't know. Can you imagine putting a swimming pool? I guess, you know, yeah, you don't want to get your feet all sandy, but you, this would be a nice place for a pool, except, oh, there's the Caribbean Ocean right there. Um, and there's the this white line back here is the barrier reef. So great place to do um, archaeology. This was our field season from May 25th to June 23rd back in 2017. We really had an ideal setup. Um, if I'd have been a little bit more clever, I would have not put this trench, which is trench eight, right about where I had saw the construction or I'd seen the construction workers digging that pit to throw in their debris. Um, but I, I missed it for the most part. Anyway, we got some really interesting information from this and other trenches. And then, um, yeah, we hit some modern things too. This concrete slab or the remnants of it that had been broken up in the middle of our trench. Um, that was unexpected. It had all these conch shells associated with it. I'm not sure what those were for. Um, could have been just a convenient place to dispose of something that people didn't want anymore. Um, but you can see where the, the upright two by fours went. Um, the concrete was poured around them. There's another one. And then we did dig a small one by one test unit right in the middle here. Um, but lots of evidence of, uh, again, all three periods of occupation, not as much from Spanish colonial times as we would like, uh, but you could see uh, these um, 19th century bottles here. There's a, a tumbler, a glass tumbler. Um, I think Dr. Mayfield can correct me when I'm wrong, which I probably will be. I think these are manatee bones, and this is part of a manatee rib. Um, all the you know, pottery that 
dates from uh, the 19th century. This is, I think, some transfer print whiteware, um, a Maya biface sitting inside um, a, um, some kind of ceramic vessel for balm or salve or pomade. I'm not sure what, but a whole mixture. And then mostly Maya sherds, pot sherds here. Um, but so the upper deposits we found um, really even up to about almost a meter below the existing ground surface um, were fairly mixed with uh, these different periods of occupation or material culture from different periods of occupation. Um, we got some beautiful uh, patent medicine bottles. I had a very talented student, um, artistically talented, who drew these um, wonderful uh, illustrations that made it into the, the preliminary report. Um, but one of the things we found were these successive layers of uh, Maya flooring. So these would have been um, uh, floors that the Maya would have walked on um, during, you know, everyday use of their domiciles. Um, we found that they dug pits through the floors of their houses. Here's another one. And this is a whole ceramic vessel that was in very poor shape. It was very thinly made vessel to begin with. Um, but all of these dark deposits that kind of are sandwiched in between the Maya layers, these, these white floor deposits, um, is midden material. Um, and you can see the, the density of conch shells in the corner here. Um, but the material we were finding was just tremendous. Really good bone preservation. Again, the site dates to the contact period and just slightly before. So we're talking probably maybe late, very late 1300s through the 14 and 1500s. And then it was probably abandoned sometime in the 1500s or the 16th century uh, by the Maya. But again, here's a close up. You can see these marl floors. This is like lime and sand um, mixed and compressed together. And so the Maya were reflooring some of their structures periodically, renovating their houses. Um, and then the earliest flooring deposit sits on this nice clean beach sand. Um, so again, the, the, de the, de the earliest deposits were pr pr producing artifacts that date to probably safe to say the, the 1400s and 1500s. Um, you could see some of the shirts sticking out of the sidewall here. Um, Dr. Simmons, someone has their yeah, hand up. Uh, yeah, Joyce, go ahead. Oh. Hi. Um, I just wanted to clarify when you said the upper level, um, right, like a meter below, you said it was a mix of time periods. Um, why was it a mix and um, what time periods were the mix of? Yeah, great question, Joyce. Um, as you look at this picture from Lam and I. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, they were probably mixed because this area of town, probably most areas of town have been pretty heavily used and, and therefore disturbed by Belizeans who are constructing their own homes. Um, there's all kinds of utility lines, pipes. Um, so I think a lot of that is, is, is disturbance that's probably happened most of it in the last 40 or 50 or 60 years. And um, I, you know, I, but I don't know exactly the, the whole process of how and why that parcel was disturbed in the way it was, because I don't have a good land use history of, of the, the Parham property there. Um, that's something that, that I, I kind of need to get into and I could probably use some help on, um, you know, what was built there and the, you know, how, how old is the building? What's the land use history before the building was built? and so forth. But um, so there's artifacts, the Maya artifacts are probably from the 14 and 1500s. Then um, the earliest historic artifacts are probably what, mid, mid 19th century, Dr. Mayfield, or early to mid 19th century? Yeah, early to mid 19th century, yeah. And, and then, and then the, the last time period is, is kind of, you can lump it all into modern. So you know, from the 1950s onwards. Um, but yeah, that's a good question, Joyce, because we're not sure of how it is that all of these time periods got kind of, the artifacts from these time periods got mixed up and thrown together. 
we, we did find in one trench a rather large trash pit. And I know it was a trash pit because there, there were Belican bottles, Belican's the national beer of Belize, there were Coke bottles, um, there were paint cans, um, all kinds of rusted metal. So there was modern stuff that had intruded into the earlier deposits. Um, and I suspect that's the case with, with other areas around the site too. Um, I just wanted to throw this one slide in to contrast how, the, how these house houses look. On, on the island, they were pole and thatch superstructures with simple packed marl floors. On the mainland at places like Wamanai, you can see that this house structure has been outlined in stones. Um, there's the eastern edge. Um, and um, this is floor ballast that has not been excavated yet. In other words, material that the Maya brought in, dirt, midden rocks to, to build up the floor surface of the house. And then the Maya, yeah, would bury their dead under the floors of the houses. You, you could see that this is a partial little crypt here. That's even a half of a broken matate right there. There's the break line. And then there's part of their mar marl floor here with my little north arrow scale and um, a burial right there. It so they look a little bit different, but I think that's more owing to the, um, um, the, um, their, their geography, to put it simply. Um, and then we have some beautiful late post-classic material. This is, again, the stuff that dates to the 14 and 1500s, the later stuff, um, incised potsherds that are um, pretty commonly found on the mainland. Um, the ceramicists call this palmu incised. I wouldn't have known that before I talked to my colleague, Dr. Jim Amers, he told me about that. And there he is, um, the sly guy that he is. He's actually one of the top ceramicists working in not just Mesoamerica, but Belize for sure. Um, and uh, yeah, so if there's any misidentifications, then um, yeah, it's not my fault. Um, <laughs> These are vessels, uh, I'll go back, that uh, probably were used as incensarios, the, or incense burners. We found a couple of those, which speaks to the idea that, um, you know, household ritual, domestic level ritual was going on. Um, these are some other uh, uh, incensario sherds that we found. So it wasn't just, um, you know, trade items that uh, were you know, pretty beautiful polychromes or incised vessels later on um, that were used for food storage and food serving. Um, there were also vessels indicative of um, a domestic ritual. Uh, I don't know what this is. I, I, I mean, it's a small jar, obviously. And again, the student who was so good at illustrating did a great job of this. I think it, my hunch is the, the, the one, the idea I want to go with is that this is a, um, a pot that was made by a child or somebody young who was just learning about making pottery. Maybe this was, you know, uh, an apprentice to a potter. I'm not sure. Um, but, um, you know, these mini jars or could have had a specific function to hold a very small amount of something, <laughs> but I think, it, I, I wanna think it's kind of a, a practice jar. Uh, these effigy feet, um, again, great illustrations. I, I wonder if this could be an image of Echua, the, the merchant god. The reason I say that is because the, this, this deity in the Maya world has a very pronounced nose, um, other than that, it could be, it just could be a coincidence, um, but I'd like to think it could be a representation of Ektua, the, the merchant god. Um, some of the uh, lithic assemblage, again, I, I think a lot of these were used for refishing. Uh, we did find one small side notch projectile point. Um, this is, you can see from the scale, pretty small. It's maybe about three centimeters in length. That would have been used for small game. Um, maybe even birds, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, but, uh, you know, most of this material is coming from Kolha, which is on the mainland. I 
you know, people have called it the lithic superstore of Belize. And then, boy, lots and lots of fish bones. Uh, uh, the faunal assemblage, Dr. Mayfield can tell you, was really rich um, and pretty well preserved. Of course, you know, the deposits we were digging in were only about five to six, maybe 700 years old um, at the San Pedro site, uh, but still nice, nice assemblage of material. And there she is at work, hard at work, Dr. Mayfield um, doing a stupendous, spectacular, really outstanding job of um, basically running our field lab. Um, so uh, this is the old hotel now, when we were digging there, it was a hostel. Now it's been converted back to a hotel, but the folks were, very, this is the front office of the hotel right through this glass door. They were very kind and allowed us access basically anywhere we wanted on the property, um, including on the big front porch here, which we kind of took over at times to, to do our work. Um, cats were everywhere. Cats were on the sides of the excavation units. Um, cats would sit, I should have thrown a slide in of cats sitting in our drying racks, which I kind of irritated me because I don't want animals lying on the artifacts, but anyway, um, they, they were our constant companions at the site. Um, just the last couple of slides, we did notice some similarities in terms of mortuary behavior um, between a couple of the communities on the island and, and Lamanai. Um, there appears to be these uh, connections in terms of material culture and mortuary behavior, and in some regards, the architecture as well, um, between these island communities and the biggest mainland site in northern Belize, which is Lamanai. So it's just a weird pattern of, of burying people face down, right, with their legs bent. I mean, I mean, try this at home, right? Lay on your belly on the floor grab your ankles and try and pull them back over um, your backside. Not easy to do, but that's how these people were buried. Um, and this was a, a younger individual. And boy, again, you don't need a, you know, archaeology degree or even a college diploma, although you should get one, to see the, the clear burial cut here that I'm outlining um, with the cursor. Clean beach sand up here. But look at all this dark staining in here, and especially all this charcoal. I think that there must have been some sort of rituals, probably that took place at about the time that this youngster was interred um, to commemorate the, this person's life. So they were burying things and burning things, I should say, at the same time uh, or in the same sort of time frame as, as this individual was being buried. So just weird, Professor, you know, we have a question. at a have, couple of plates. Go ahead. We have a question from Elena yeah. Giocha. Elena, if you want to. Uh, yes, I, my question is about the way that they're buried. So I was like wondering if they were found on like different locations of the island or different islands, why do you think they're similar? And like, do you think it's because um it was, it's kind of like a postrative manner? Like they're kneeling in prayer in their death, kind of like commemorating either like a God or something which is like, why do we be yeah. the way they are? Yeah, that, that's a good observation, Elena. I, I hadn't thought of that. My, my sort of go-to answer that, that I'm not sure is correct, um, but there's an analytical method that you can use to determine this um, is that these are, these are related people. They're either related through blood or through marriage. Um, these communities are not very far apart on the island. Um, Lamanai is a little farther away, and the burials actually date at Lamanai to several centuries before these burials at the San Pedro site. Uh, something like 97% of the burials at San Pedro site are buried like this. Um, we only found the one, but um, Pendergast and Graham, when they were digging there in the mid-90s, found several dozen um, and they were all buried like this but so I, I, I there there has to have been either some sort of shared worldview that these people had um, that you know included this sort of burial position 
this sort of mortuary behavior. Um, or it could be, I guess, and it could be as well that the, the, there was some kind of either blood or marriage relationship between these people in these communities. Not so much Lom and I, I guess, because again, these are these are um, a little uh, earlier in time, several centuries earlier. But it's a really good question, and I and I don't I don't have the answer. The analytical technique, though, is is um, um, looking at the isotope signatures in bone. Um, and from there, you can get general, a, at least a general idea of where people were coming from. Um, I think they just did this at, at Teotihuacan and um, were finding that there was a enclave of people that uh, were probably from the central Paten, maybe even Tikal that were living at Teotihuacan, which is just northeast of Mexico City. So the, these, you know, um, bone isotopes uh, uh, can, can, you know, maybe provide some clues as to the origins of these people. But if they're all from the island or from the, these coastal communities, I'm, I'm not sure, um, I'm not sure you can get finer resolution than that, but I've got to look into it. I got you. Um, Thank again, you so much. Cole, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, Kolha, we know that the Maya of, on the key were getting um, their lithic material from Kolha. Interesting that there may be other connections in terms of similarities in mortuary behavior, at least in one structure. So this was a structure that was excavated back in the 70s. Um, by Norman Hammond, uh, and uh, they found this same weird burial pattern. It's it just hard to explain what it is or what it means. Anyway, that's it. I, I think I, maybe I've taken up too much time here, but I, I just wanted to thank you and thank all the people who made our work on the island possible. Uh, we had a great crew in 2017. Um, hope to get uh, hope to get some more uh, great people out there next summer. So, if you're interested, bug Dr. Mayfield about it, and then go to Providencia Island with her too. Awesome. Yeah. So Dr. I'd be happy. To, yeah, I could answer any questions that folks have. Uh, great. Thank you guys we're, again. We're I appreciate. Pretty small group. If you want to jump in, but if you want to raise your hand, that's fine. So we can start off with Ralph. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for coming and speaking to all of us on such an interesting project, Dr. Simmons. It was really interesting to learn about and even more importantly, to kind of like put into perspective the, I guess, really extensive economic interconnectedness of the pre-colonial uh, Mayan world. And I just have one question. Um, what are some of like the difficulties, if any exist, in like excavating a tropical coastal site that may be like more severely uh, prone to being impacted by natural processes such as like the rise in sea levels due to global warming and like the annual spread of like tropical cyclones, hurricanes and other storms? Yeah, that's a that's a terrific question, Ralph, and, and one that worries me too. And and one of the um, one of the rationales for us to do the lidar work is is because of just that rising sea levels. Um, part of the Marco Gonzalez site is is now underwater. I mean, and and the water is you know six to eight inches deep, but it's still submerged. And we wonder how many other sites that are along the margins or the shoreline of the island have, have suffered a similar fate where now, I mean, the sea level has been rising for a millennium um, or more. So, you know, but the beautiful thing about LIDAR is, is that uh, those radar or those, um, those laser pulses can go through water. I mean, they've, they've been, I, we just saw a great special the other night on, um, mapping uh, the decline of coral reefs around the world. And, and they're able to actually use LIDAR to, to see which are the dead 
or bleached out parts of these reefs and which are still the living parts. So, so if we can get the LIDAR survey done, then we can, we can get a better handle on how many communities were, were actually on the island. Um, and then we have to do the archeology span to test to see what time periods they date to. But yeah, sea level rise is a big issue um, if you're working in an urban setting, then then tourism and you know dealing with the public, which which is a good thing for archaeologists to do, um, but it's a, it has its own set of issues. Um, digging in sandy soil um, worries me a, a little bit because sand is kind of unstable, and and you know you can only get so far down without having to really seriously worry about collapse and and you know, uh, using shoring or bracing to prevent collapse. Um, and then, um, you know, just the heat and humidity are, are kind of tough. If there's not much of a breeze, um, then the, the heat and humidity are pretty stifling in, in, um, in Belize in the summertime, which is when, you know, we, we do our work. Uh, but those are the big concerns. I think the people on the mainland have have more. Uh, yeah, and mosquitoes. <laughs> That's right. The the people on the mainland have like poisonous snakes that they have to worry about with and um, you know tarantulas and scorpions. And I, I have never seen a tarantula, a scorpion, or a snake on that island. I, I'll bet they exist, but so far they've left us alone, which is nice. <laughs> Well, hopefully it stays that way. Thank you. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Thanks, Ralph. Um, hey, Trent, Trent or whoever wants to go next, it doesn't matter to me. Yeah, I can go ahead. Uh, I just had a question, uh, Professor Simmons, about you're talking about San Marcos site and how there is evidence of obsidian from, coming from Guatemala and central Mexico. I was curious if yeah. there's, there's evidence of those that trade occurring at the same time with those two different locations, or if it was more like there that San Marcos site was relying on maybe Guatemala at one point in time, and then started to rely more heavily on Central Mexico. That's a that's a good, that's a great question, Trent. Um, so the the pattern that that archaeologists have found so far in the Maya world is uh, in general is that. Uh, um, in pre-classic, late pre-classic times, so a couple few centuries before the birth of Christ and then a couple after, um, the, most Maya peoples were getting their obsidian from one source in Highland Guatemala, the San Martin Hilotepeque source. Then that shifted um, in early classic times uh, to um, the El Chayal source, and then it shifted again in middle and late classic times to the Ixtapeque source. And those are all in Highland Guatemala. Uh, but the, the other funny thing is that, that the, these communities, um, both on the mainland and on the island, were also getting materials, obsidian from central Mexico at the same time. So, so if you look at the percentages, uh, if you have you know 100 pieces, 60% um, is going to come from um, Highland Guatemala, but the other 40% is going to come from a variety of sources throughout uh, Mexico, the central Mexico, that is. Uh, and and this, is, this is the pattern throughout late pre-classic, early classic, and middle classic as well. So it's, it's funny. It, it, on the one hand, it looks like there was a preference toward certain Guatemalan sources of obsidian, um, but they, they were also happy to get obsidian from a wide range of Mexican sources. So it's like, and you know, the funny thing to me is why, why would they, how, how could they tell? I mean, if you hold up two pieces of obsidian, um, so I've got two pieces of obsidian and I look at them visually, right? I can say they're both grayish black. This one might have some banding or some striping in it, but this one doesn't. Otherwise, they look pretty much the same to me. <laughs> so, you know, we can tell that there are differences by using the, um, 
by using X-ray fluorescence, the XRF machine, but the ancient Maya would have only had their naked eyes and, and could look at these macroscopically and say, yeah, they're both kind of gray black. <laughs> so why did they care if, if you couldn't really tell? You know, now the green versus the black, that's a dramatic difference. But the gray black stuff looks kind of homogenous anyway. So why did they care if some came from Paredon and others pieces came from Ucareo and other pieces came from Zacualtipan? I, I, I don't know. I, Maybe the price was right that day. We'll take the cheap stuff. <laughs> it's gray black. It looks good. It's pretty sharp. Yeah, it'll do. I don't know. <laughs> it's a good question, though. Thanks for answering that. I find that pretty interesting how, how they had like preferences and they were able to like selectively choose. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. I mean, there must have been some pe people who could say, oh, yeah. Oh, okay, I see. There's this, this kind of patterning in the banding. Yeah, that's the good stuff. This stuff is just kind of a hazy gray black. Ah, we don't want that. I, I don't know. Maybe, you know, there was a, you know, connoisseur of obsidian who could distinguish just by, visually, but I sure can't. Not very well, anyway. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, yeah. So, how about you, Aiden? Uh, firstly, thank you so much for uh, coming to speak to them. And uh, the thing I, I was really curious about was uh, how did they develop and get the knowledge and the science behind creating the salt in, the, in Mesoamerica with the unslipped shirt? Like, it, it seemed like it's a whole unique process to be able to do that. So I, I was very curious how, how they got that knowledge to, to do it. Yeah, yeah I... You know, we don't know the answer to that. It's, it's not very clear cut. I mean, the easy thing to say would be um, trial and error. You know, they experimented and figured out what worked and what didn't. Um, you know, they obviously were, were in and around that water all the time. So they knew it was salty. You could, you could, you know, just taste it. If you, you know, if you've opened your mouth swimming in the ocean, you know, <laughs> You know, you get at that big gulp of salt water, like, ah! so they, they must have thought, hey, if, if we could just if we could just get rid of the water part, then then the salt that's left is is what we really want. Um, and, and they, you know, they were right because, the, you know, we we worry about, you know, salt and high blood pressure. Well, you know, but if you're sweating in the jungle or on an island and you know, in, in the tropics, you're losing a lot of salt. And if your salt levels get off in your body, then, um, you know, you're in trouble. You, you start to feel really bad and, and you've got to correct that. So they knew that it was an absolute necessity to have that salt, but how they figured out that, oh yeah, okay, like make these really thin bodied or thin walled shirts, hold them over the fire for this long, um, you know, just let that water vaporize off. I mean, I, I, I really do think it must have been just some trial and experimentation and, and they figured out it may have taken a generation or two or even longer to figure out how to perfect that process, but, but they did it. And um, they were really successful. Um, and so they, those island communities were probably seen by people on the mainland as really as important maybe a kind of a cultural backwater, but super important because they provided this resource that was, you know, absolutely critical for people who were living in the jungle on the mainland. And so, however they figured it out, they, they got it right. And, and they, uh, you know, they, they must have made a, a pretty good name for themselves in doing it. Yeah, thanks for the question. Of course, thank you. Uh, okay, so there's Alex, Rob, and how, how, how you, how you, I'm not sure how you go. pronounce your name. <clears throat> okay. Go if that's all right. Uh, thank you so much for having sure. this talk. Uh, you had said that the end of the Maya is yeah, now being point. viewed as, can you hear me? Yes, I do, Rob. 
Okay, sorry. You you had said the end of the Maya is now being viewed as more of a transition than a true collapse of society. And I was kind of wondering what work and evidence has motivated that classification when you see so many sites like truly abandoned as they are. Yeah, so, you know, there's this old um, kind of paradigm, I, I guess, in anthropology the, that used to be called the big tradition and the little tradition. But people don't use those ter terms anymore, but I think they're really apt. The big tradition has, you know, uh, kings, queens, you know, sort of this upper crust, if you will, or upper part of society that... Uh, you know, was really influential in every aspect of, of, of life for, for any state level society, AKA civilization or stratified society, some anthropologists say. But when you strip that away, um, then what you're left with is the little tradition or the household tradition, which has strong continuities through time. I mean, we see it in the Maya world still today uh, where, you know, uh, the, the, the lifestyles of farmers and fisher folk um, probably really hasn't changed through the millennia all that dramatically. Um, so, you know, some people are thinking that what, what, what really happened is the society didn't collapse. Um, and, and in fact, people have, you know, not you guys or anthropologists in general, but lay people, you know, people outside the field have thought, uh, well, the Maya just collapsed and therefore went away. They disappeared. Well, that's a misconception too. There are six or seven thousand million Maya that live in the Maya lowlands and highlands still today that speak um, some some Maya language. So, um, you know, what what people of researchers have have kind of more gravitated toward in the last twenty or so years is that. The society underwent some some big and profound transformations, some big changes. But the biggest changes were that the upper crust was kind of stripped away. All the trappings of the elites, um, um, you know, things like um, um, astronomy, um, architecture, and engineering, um, um, complex ritual behaviors that in, involved uh, lots of people. Uh, religious festivals. Those are the things that kind of went by the wayside. Um, the sacred ball game, you can throw into that too. But what was left was the, 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 the household tradition, which has, again, as I said, largely remained the same over time. It, it, there have been some big impacts, obviously Spanish colonialism, um, the rise of globalism, interconnectedness of all societies. Um, you know, there have been some big changes, the impacts of uh, religious conversion and Catholicism on the Maya. Um, but a lot of the, the continuities we see, um, um, you know, persisting or these traditions persisting from past to present. So if people wanna, they wanna temper that, that word. They don't wanna use something as dramatic as collapse because that implies that, you know, the, the society completely failed and is just gone, done away with. Um, so, you know, people are trying to just hedge a little and say uh, transition or transformation. Um, and I think that's probably a little bit more accurate, uh, but you'll never get the term collapse out of the literature or out of discussions because it's, it's just so deeply embedded. I, I hope that that helps. That's kind of my take on it anyway. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Professor Simmons. Um, thank you for giving such an interesting talk. And um, I just have a question because um, I know like communications is always like very important like for excavation programs. And you said like, especially yeah. when you're yeah. working in a urban setting um it's always like very important to like communicate with the government and landowners um to get the permission um for the excavation and you said there like you found a site in a hotel property and 
Well, how did you like persuade the hotel owner to like allow you to do the excavation? And have you ever like encountered any problems like in getting the permission from the landowners and the government? Yeah, so I'll, the second question first, and I'm, I'm knocking on my wooden desk. <laughs> no, so far I haven't had any problems with getting permissions. Um, of course, with the government, you have to put um, together a formal proposal um, that outlines, you know, your goals, your methods, um, the timeline, um, the budget as well. Um, and the government, in this case, the Belize Institute of Archaeology has to approve that in order for you to get a permit, which actually has like a, a little gold seal and blue ribbon at the bottom. And the, the seal is impressed with the IOA logo. It's very official looking. And, <laughs> and so what I do is I make a photocopy of that and I, I stick it in a clear, clear plastic sleeve, tape the top up and then nail that to a tree. So that anybody who comes to the site can see, hey, they have official authorization to work here. Um, but even before that, you're right, it starts with the landowner. And sometimes, you know, it's it's just um, it's just it's just getting to know each other and, and forming that sort of trusting relationship with one another, where you know, you tell them about the benefits of doing the work. Um, um, and um, it, it doesn't hurt that, um, in fact, it helps quite a lot if they have at least a, a, a basic interest in the past. They, they might not know much about archaeology. They maybe never took an archaeology course, um, but they think the artifacts that, you know, turn up on their property are kind of cool. And so you, you start to, you know, try and, and, and nurture that interest as much as you can. Um, and without, you know, lecturing or, or going into tremendous detail, you could just say, yeah, see this, see this cool piece of obsidian that I found? You know, we have a machine, an analytical technique that can tell you exactly where this came from. And they go, whoa, that's pretty cool. And then when you tell them, yeah, this piece of obsidian may have come from as far as, as a uh, 1500 miles away from here and they go whoa you know how did they do that did they have 18 wheelers rolling through yucatan and you know big cargo no they didn't have any of that stuff they did it in canoes and they go whoa canoes so it helps to have somebody who's who's kind of got that intellectual curiosity to begin with and then you you just try and and uh, i don't know it's you know <laughs> You know, you just be personable and friendly and, um, you know, hope, hope you can charm them a little bit. And if they can give you, if they give you permission, um, then I always request a formal letter. And sometimes I type the thing out saying, you know, Dr. Scott Simmons and his crew have permission to work on my property from May 25th to June 23rd, yada, yada, yada. Um, or sometimes they write it and sign it. And then you can go, to, you know, here's my piece of paper that the landowner says it's official. Um, and um, I include that in my proposal to the Institute of Archaeology so that they know that, that um, you know, that, that base has been covered already, that, uh, you know, I'm clear for that. Um, you know, I've just been lucky, I guess, with the landowners but so far, but I'm sure, you know, like anything, you know, you, your luck doesn't hold forever. Um, and there may be people who say, no, absolutely not. I, I don't want to have anything to do with you. I don't care about the past. All I care about is the future and the present. Yeah, those artifacts are cool, but you can have them. You know, I mean, there are probably people like that. But uh, I, I think Belizeans are curious about their past in general. And uh, they know that the Maya had a big part of, of, of that. Um, we're, we're a big, a big and heavy duty, robust chapter in that story of, of modern Belize. So um, it's not such a hard sell sometimes. I hope that, that helped. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. I like your Dodgers hat. That's your profile pic.
Yeah, I guess I'm kind of the last question. Um, but I just wanted to thank you so much yeah. for the presentation. It was really interesting seeing everything, uh, all the work that you've been been doing there. It's uh, it's incredible. And I was just kind of interested, like, with how long this excavation has been going, um, how do you keep track of and where's like the artifacts like stored um, that you've dug up for been, what, like 30 years or so? Uh, and is, are, are there any challenges yeah. specifically uh, since it's an island that, that everything has been done? Like challenges getting it off the island and stuff. Yeah, so so that's a great question, Alex. And one that, you know, that, that situation has been changing over about the last year. Um, we, all of the artifacts now from um, our project, at least, not Tom Guterjohn's project, the UT Tyler archaeologist, but all of our artifacts are in a storage facility on the island. Um, and it's very, very, the storage facility is uh, right next to the site of Marco Gonzalez. So we've got these, um, the Mennonites in, are a, a minority group in Belize. Um, they speak some low form of German, I've been told, um, kind of like the Amish, kind of like Quakers, I guess. But anyway, they make our boxes. We've got these galvanized metal boxes that all the artifacts go into and they're, they're lidded and they've got handles. Um, of course, galvanized metal won't rust and that's why we chose that over steel. And we've got dozens of those boxes in the storage facility, but now the woman who uh, purchased the building materials and had the, the storage building built, uh, her name's Jan Brown, has decided she wants to sell the land and sell the building. Um, but she's offered to build a small storage facility just for our, um, our equipment, shovels, screens, tools, all of that, you know, kind of construction like material that archaeologists use, you know, trowels and so forth. Um, but the artifacts, there's, we're, we're going to have to deal with those artifacts. Um, and so I actually was going to talk to the Parums, the people who own the property that we've been digging on, to see if um, they would like some or all of the artifacts back. Um, and if they don't, if we could have their permission to uh, bury them back on the site. Um, and we're, I don't know where that's going to go. I haven't uh, broached that topic yet with the landowner, the, the Parham family. Um, but we'll see because uh, it's, it's a real issue uh, what to do with the material. You, you know, ostensibly this material is going to be you know, you, you conserve it and you house it in a, in a secure facility so that future researchers, um, you guys, if you go to grad school or a grad program, um, tons of possible master's theses or PhD dissertations, um, if you want to look at the ceramics or the lithics or the bone or the historic material. Um, but in reality, you know, that, that doesn't happen very often. Unfortunately, it's not like we have, you know, a whole queue of grad students who are lined up waiting to look at this material that we've excavated uh, from years ago. Uh, so, you know, the, Dr. Graham and I who are kind of, you know, putting our heads together about these sites and uh, trying to make sense of them. Um, we've got to talk about what, what our next steps are with these artifacts. Because we can house, as I said, the, um, the equipment, um, the tools that we need to, to do the field work, uh, but the artifacts are another story. So I, I don't know what's going to happen with them, honestly. And it's, you know, you have a sort of professional responsibility to deal with these things um, in, in, a, in an ethical way. Um, and... Uh, so I'm looking at our options right now, trying to figure out well, what's going to happen next. Because the person who owns the bodega um, really wants to get rid of it and be done with it, um, sell it off. Um, depending on who she sells it to, we might be able to, as they say, kick the can down the road a little farther. 
if the person that she sells it to is okay with us still housing some or all the artifacts there, then great. But my suspicion is if they buy that building, they're gonna wanna put what they wanna put in that building. Um, thank you, Elena. So I don't know, good question. I was just reading Elena, Elena's note there. Do, do we have time for one more question? Uh, I think Sam has a question. Hi, yeah, I just have sure, a I'm... question. Um, just like a general question to sort of end off. Um, thank you so much for coming and speaking with us, honestly. Um, but I was just wondering in general, throughout the, the length of your project, um, if there was anything that you expected to find and you didn't, or if there was something that you were particularly surprised by finding throughout, just in general? Yeah, I mean, as, as far as the surprised by finding, I, I am a, I'm amazed at, at, at the, um, the, the sheer volume of material that is just on the surface of some of these sites. Um, you can't walk on the site of Marco Gonzalez um, in some places without literally crushing pottery under your feet, which is not a good feeling. <laughs> but um, there's so much, not just on the ground surface, but of course below the ground surface. But it, it just, when you walk on these sites, um, you know, whether it's the coconut walked on slip, the, uh, um, the salt making vessels or um, the chert um, obsidian animal bones, it's just the, the, the volume of material is astounding. I, it, it would be really fascinating. I don't know how you would determine this, but it would be really fascinating to get a sense of, okay, well, how many obsidian blades were cycling through uh, this site every year? You know, how many chert bifaces uh, were being moved by these people through this site every year? Uh, I, I don't know, it's impossible to figure that out, but, but in, in short, the, the, the volume or the, the high densities of this material suggest pretty strongly that um, it was an incredible amount of material that these people were moving. Um, you know, it would probably make, you know, drug lords, cartel bosses, like, astounded. Geez, we don't move, you know, this many bales of cocaine a year, but the people in ancient times were moving like 10 times the obsidian that you know we would help to move through we would hope to move through in terms of some other some drug or whatever but so that that every time i go onto these sites i'm surprised by that uh you know how many salt cakes were being produced every month and every year by some of these sites um had to be in the tens of thousands if you're talking about over the course of 12 months Tens of thousands of salt cakes were probably moving through these sites and, and being shipped into not just inland on these river courses into these big mainland sites, but around the Yucatan Peninsula uh, and even south, right, uh, down into Honduras. Um, so as far as what we haven't found, I, I really expected to find more human remains the last time we are at the same. San Pedro site, um, just because Graham and Pendergast, when they were working there in the mid nineties, found several dozen. And so we, I think that is a sampling issue um, where, um, you know, we only sampled, we, we dug four trenches. Um, you saw the tarps over them. Um, I just think we were digging in, in areas that, that where, where we, we missed some of the houses so we missed burials that were under the floors of those houses. Um, but as far as other expectations, I, I was really pleased to, uh, I guess the, the flooring remains um, and the vessels in situ, we found uh, 
actually three whole ceramic vessels or three whole pots when we were there um, in situ, which is really kind of, that, that was unexpected to me. Um, but the flooring was so well preserved that uh, I was surprised by that. Um, and the fact that you could see the cuts in the floor um, for the one burial and the cuts in the floor for other things that the people were storing um, in pots, presumably, um, that they would lower down. And they probably put something on top to, so that people wouldn't step on it, um, probably covered it with something um, you know, to protect the contents and, and to keep people from falling into holes in the floor of their house. Um, but those, those were a couple of the things that stood out to me. Yeah, that is really, that's really interesting. Right. Thank you so much for answering all of our questions in such depth. Yeah, you, you, you got the last part right. So he went on and on about his answers. No, you didn't say that, I did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, it just gets my brain thinking about these things and, and I kind of jump from thing to thing. But um, yeah, it's been my pleasure, really, honestly. I definitely want to echo that. I think all the undergraduates did a fantastic job of thanking you, but thank you so much for you know going over time to answer everybody's questions so deeply. Um, and on behalf of STARC, which is the Society for Trojan Archaeologists, that's our mascot, we're the Trojans. Thank you so much. And on behalf of USC Archaeology the Department, thank you so much. I know the chair would have loved to been, have been here, but she wasn't able to make it. Um, so again, Dr. Simmons, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. My for pleasure, being here. guys. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Professor keep Simmons. Up the good work. You guys are, yeah, you're really on the ball. Um, I'm sure Dr. Mayfield loves having you guys as students. So, so keep up the good work. Your semester is getting getting close to being so over nice. um so stick with it finish out strong and and uh yeah if, uh, if anybody has any other questions i'm sure dr mayfield can can provide my email address yep. and i'd be happy to to answer them or talk more about the island <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right it was thank you guys was for great. coming through thank um, you everyone take care and have a safe and relaxing end of the semester Bye bye. Yeah. yeah, it was so good to see you, Scott. So very good. I miss you. Thank I love working you. together. So um, this was fun Thank for you. me. We'll, we'll get it together again. Oh we'll yeah, do it we again. Will. I'll keep. You and we'll go to 